Welcome to chapter 14. At this point, at the far end of the semester and the far end of the book, you'll be finding that a lot of the theories and the frameworks are starting to loop around and connect together. In particular, when we're talking about the communication and its role in the service gap and how external communications interact with service delivery, not only will you see the crossover with classic advertising theory, uh, the discussion of integrated marketing communications, but you'll also start seeing some of the fundamental principles from the early parts of semester where we're talking about the service promise and communicating a service promise. So we talk about over-promising and under-delivering and the creation of the gap. We can see from the diagram that the gap, that the communications goes back to some of the core foundation. So the thing about the gaps model is this looping mechanism where you can see the interplay that if you close the communications gap or if you modify communications that can open up gaps in expectations and in what the customer will regard as an acceptable minimum service or what the customer will have in terms of zone of tolerance. So the key areas for this chapter that you want to be aware of is the creation of the provider gap really comes down to if your communication isn't cohesive. If you are promising a particular service overtly, so on your advertising you show happy smiling faces, and in reality you're a dentist who specializes in root canal, yeah, you're uh, possibly promising what you can't deliver. At the same time, if you have one part of your communication strategy, say for example, your social media is a very friendly, informal, very conversational, communicative type of arrangements, but when people go to the service, they find it to be very uh, formal, very driven by uh, procedure and formality and not terribly interactive then you've got a communication gap. So IMC becomes important. It goes from being a theory we talk about in advertising to being a practice inside services. The other aspect to this that we are looking at is that where we are over-promising or we're not managing customer expectation. And this is where we run into some of the problems in classic advertising theory, the idea of the mere puff where we greatly exaggerate product benefits or we stretch the possibility, we stretch reality and we do it in a comic manner or we do it in an obviously over the top element as part of our brand positioning to create and communicate a message. But with services, because the advertising message is quite frequently the only engagement people will have or the only way of measuring the product, then you've got to be careful that you don't overpromise something in a way that you would be able to get away with with a physical product that you could argue it out in the court of law that it wouldn't be reasonably uh, possible for a customer to experience this. But all you're doing is creating a sense of disappointment in advance. So what you're overpromising? This is also an area where I find there's a bit of a propensity. Uh, people who aren't fully versed in marketing, people who aren't using the whole of the marketing mix, who aren't thinking about the interplay between product, price, and promotion, tend to come into overpromising, saying, "Oh, you know, promise whatever you like, make you know, say whatever you need to do to seal the deal. Then you know, we'll negotiate the customer down later." I'm like this is a very bad decision. This says that promotion is your primary and the product must fit the promotion rather than product is your primary, the creation of value is your primary and all of that leads to communication must explain what the product can offer and does offer. Lastly, inappropriate pricing. Uh, this is the interplay. Product gives us what the service is but price gives us the expectation. So it's entirely possible to have a failure of your integrated marketing communications because your pricing strategy 
didn't match your communication strategy. So in services, price sits in two parts. It sits in its own domain, and it sits under the stable of integrated marketing communications. You have to charge what you are promising to be worth in your IMC. So let's talk about a couple of the factors here. The big one for you to be looking at is obviously the five categories, the strategies to match service promise with delivery. It's going to be a really good way to go and get yourself a nice framework, particularly because you are going to be dealing with the gaps model. Here's a chance to close out the gaps. And as stated, one of the things in this is the IMC. So if you're not comfortable with the concept of integrated marketing communications, you think that the elements should operate more autonomously, this could be a challenge. Or if you're not familiar with the, uh, the breadth of IMC. So that's a set off to the side and do your own readings to pursue. Now let's talk now briefly that in terms of how the services marketing triangle, making it, uh, I think, second or third appearance for the book. The triangle has a couple of important factors that we need to really emphasize here when we're talking about the marketing communication. And one of those things is the internal marketing communications. The company and the provider need to be, have the clarity of whatever the company is promising the provider has to deliver. So a service employee needs to be conversant with what the company is communicating as the brand promise and as the service promise. Similarly, the service promise that should be consistent with what we can expect out of our employees. The interactive marketing element amuses me that it's as far back as the 90s, they went, well, by interactive, we mean interaction and we'll stick with it. So it's the face-to-face, -face, it's the people, it's the personal selling, it's the telephone, it's the internet, it's, it's all the different component parts. It's basically where providers and customers are going to interact. So if we think about this as a command and control mechanism, the company needs to ensure that when it promises out to the external market, that there is a promise that's clearly communicated, when it communicates to its internal markets, it explains what the promises are, and that it listens to its providers to ensure that the providers are sufficiently resourced to deliver. And then, when the providers and the customers are interacting and there's the co-creation, we're still thinking about what is the service promise in the IMC? What does their advertising say about how we will interact? So if our advertising promises that we're going to be a family-friendly company, our interactions, our points of sale, our social media, our service scape, all family-friendly. If we're going to say that we're an elite pres prestige service, we're probably not even going to have Twitter. We're probably not, definitely not going to have Facebook, and we'll probably have some form of policy about handing over your mobile phone upon entering the venue. And there are clubs and organizations that operate on a, prem a position of when you enter the premise, you have to check in your mobile phone. So you cannot use your phone on the premise. But it positions that as a luxury escape, a luxury exit, to be elsewhere, to be disconnected for a period. So there's a very deliberate strategy on that front that the service provider communicates in the external marketing communication and enables the staff to deliver. So in terms of integrating services marketing communication, obviously the top of the list here is that as we've been talking about, you need to coordinate your sales and service with any media content you generate, your internet activities, and the physical service scape environment. And this is one of the critical areas, is that the service scape environment can trigger IMC responses. Particularly, if you are going to make good use of social media, make visible use of social media. If you want people who are attending a particular event to use 
a hashtag to discuss that event on social media, put the hashtag on the wall. Put the icons of the media services that you would hope people would use. Put up, say, check in on Facebook, tweet about it, post to it on Twitter, put the Twitter icon on a poster on the wall. Grant explicit permissions by putting these logos, by putting these items and artifacts onto the walls and making them visible. So the other aspect that you want to be thinking about here is in terms of how does the message translate when it's conveyed in print? Is it the same message that you will see? So what type of people are you actually putting in your print photographs? How consistent is the image of the clientele in your print and static media or your advertising against the clientele you have or you want? So all of these are factors to be considering, to be examining how we're making certain the message is consistent and able to be delivered consistently, knowing that inconsistency is a part of services marketing delivery. So the five major approaches to deal, to use in service communication channels, top of the list of things just mentioned is service intangibility. So these are the five, we're going to step through each of them. They are weighted differently in terms of depth and detail. All five play different roles. You may only need one, you may need all five. You shouldn't think of this as a rank ordering, rather than this is a selection. Which is the most appropriate? Which is the one you need to use first? Or which is the one that will have the greatest capacity to impact on the problem you're trying to solve? What is the next one that would be useful? As always, mm. this is marketing, so look for the interaction, look for the overlay. How do the components interplay? So in terms of dealing with service intangibility, now on the screen is a series of bullet points and details. The text will cover in more depth. Well, a couple of ideas here is that you want to tell a story. Services are about an experience. So the narrative structure, this is where your communications, this is where, frankly, the advent of the internet has made services really interesting as a communications promotions challenge. You can put a GoPro and a head mount or chest mount on a client, walk the client through the service. You can actually do walkthroughs, demos, demonstrations. People can see the service in operation. They can't feel the service. In fact, it's probably one of the best things that we haven't developed yet, because the last thing you want is to get all the sensory experience of a massage with none of the actual muscular relief. But we can do point of view, we can do first person view, we can do third person view. There is a set of ways to tell the story of the service encounter. You want to make use of the physicality. So one of the things that if you are doing services marketing promotion, use the service environment itself. Go into the service scape. You'll see that McDonald's shows you if they're going to emphasize the drive-through, they will show the drive-through. If they're going to emphasize a happy fun time with families, you will see people in the restaurants. So use the service scape. Get, take the opportunity that's presented to show people how to interact in the service scape. Lastly of this list is when you are looking at the way in which, you know, there's a whole series on column two here of riskier than usual performance options. Buzz, viral, word of mouth, be careful. Ultimately, a good service will be something that someone will recommend. But what you don't want to be is the service that people are talking about for all the wrong reasons. And things that you regard as quite reasonable and makes perfect sense for my market will not come across and will not translate well into a series of GIFs on BuzzFeed or a 30 second video that's posted across a dozen different sites or a seven second Vine 
of people misusing your service or misunderstanding your service promise. So be careful on that front. Just you don't necessarily want to be heading down the path of thinking any publicity is good publicity because bad publicity is terrible. Bad publicity lingers, good publicity fades. So any publicity is problematic unless it's good publicity. All right, the second element, the dealing with the service promises. You want a strong service brand. You want a brand that is based both on the communication that you undertake as a services marketer. So these are the deliberate messages, the deliberate communication strategies you build. You sit down and go, okay, this is the logo I want. This is the sort of message I want it to send. But you also create a service brand by delivering on the service. And this is where we talk about the whole idea of service branding. Again, coming back to uh, the work of Berry, so you can see that there are some key influential thinkers in the service domain. Brand awareness and brand meaning are the two component parts that combine into brand equity. Now this is a structural equation model that's visible on screen in front of you, so you can see how it looks and how it works. But the three elements that you can control and you can influence. Now I'm going to say there are three controllable elements here, despite what the model says. The way you present the brand, the way we deliver ourselves to the world, that's the first. This is your deliberate marketing paid for communications. The second controllable element is the customer experience with the company. That is the service scape, that is the whole of the gaps model and operation. In the middle, the non-controllable external brand communications. This is actually less uncontrollable than we'd necessarily believe. But this is where you're looking at, with a service brand, how do you see other people's experience? It's not enough to just directly go, this customer is mine, I will give them a good experience whilst they're here. The customer will observe the experience of others within the service environment. So if you're an airline and it's quite obvious that uh, your staff are ignoring or poorly treating another customer, that is going to impact on your brand and your brand communication. And this is why the whole idea of the viral media is a terrible thing. Because you are in danger of your message getting out of your control, but also you're in danger of presenting a brand communication that doesn't fit or doesn't suit what it is you're trying to do with your service or the market you're trying to attract. Third on the list, approaches for managing customer expectations. Realism, As I cannot overemphasize the importance of promising a realistic. So it doesn't matter what the textbooks will say in terms of communication strategies and creative strategies. Don't overpromise. Promise within a window that is attainable. Smart, specific. Measurable, attainable, realistic, timetabled. The realistic promise that delivers, the brand that delivers consistently is going to be more value than the brand that promises the earth and, as they say in the classics, delivers a bucket of dirt. Technically, you delivered earth. It's just not what, was, what the consumer thought you were promising. So don't use your IMC to create false expectation. Service guarantees get to roll again. Not necessarily the ultimate or uh, perfect way, but certainly a way to say we expect this service to take place the way we intend it to. So a service guarantee is also that moment where you say, if it goes wrong, it's our problem. Third on the list, clearly communicate differences between options. And really, the tiered value and the choices Make certain that people can see there is a point to having gold, silver, platinum as three separate tiers. And if you have a bronze, silver, gold, platinum, titanium, unobtainium set of levels, then 
have a strategy around communicating why someone would want to move from one to the other, why there are benefits to upgrading, and then also why there are benefits to downgrading. If you've got someone who's accidentally gotten to unobtainium and they don't suit the market, give them a chance to downgrade and leave. Lastly, teach use your communications to teach your customers how to perform their role. And this is both communicating service effectiveness and links over to customer education. The slice of life point of view, this is how the service works. I really do advocate there, just chuck a head cam on someone, put a sports action camera on them, get them to walk through the service encounter, go back and then look at the service encounter to see what are the points here that you would need to explain or what are the points that actually seeing the service take place is self-explanatory once you know and you've seen someone select the options. The other thing is to make certain that when you are setting up your customer education approach that you are honest in your communications. So you set up your performance standards, your expectations, and you talk to the customer. The great thing about inconsistency in services is that we can communicate, because co-production, the customer is at the point of production, we can do clarifications, we can talk before, after, and during, during the service delivery. So it's really important that we continue the conversation and the dialogue. We don't see the communication as a one-way street, we see the IMC as a two-way and an interaction. And lastly, on the things to do is manage internal marketing communication. You need to ensure that if there's going to be a special offer, the first, per, the first group of people who know, hear about it and get the details are the employees. And I say this as someone who works for a large organization the ANU is quite a substantial group. Periodically, we find out about offers from students or we find out about offers on the day. You know, we tend to an open day and we look around and go, wow, okay, what is it we need to know in order to effectively communicate to the customers? Because it's very easy to forget the different roles people will play, particularly if you're going to have casual or on-call volunteer staff. So it's not just your primary staff, it's your volunteer staff who need to know what are the communications, what are the offers, what's on. You also want, if you're going to have a brand position, you want to make certain that brand position is consistent with the culture of the company. One of the things that you will find kills a brand really quickly is where the company's culture doesn't match the brand's culture. So you work for a very conservative organization, it's risk averse, it likes things written, still written out by hand or printed in triplicate and signed on each separate form rather than one time. You can't have a brand of innovation if you are still using a quill and ink welts. You can't have a brand that doesn't fit with the way that the organization works because the discord, the falseness will shine through and it will harm both your communication and the staff morale. And the last part to this I'm going to draw your attention to is when we're trying to close the communications gap, the biggest thing that I would emphasize is you need to make certain there's a mechanism in place to ensure that you don't overpromise and that whatever promises you're making in your IMC are being fed back to your service design and your service implementation. And as always, if you need me, there's the email address or hit me up across Twitter. This is to the very tail end, very near the end of semester, so if your eyes are on the final exam, this is one of the areas where uh, communications gap does link nicely across the whole of the uh, gap model, so it's an area that you can bring into play in a lot of component parts of answering questions about how to use the gap to solve a services marketing practical problem.